Good morning to everyone. Welcome to this huge room. Um, <laughs> I have to tell you that uh, it feels like we're among us, but we're not, because people are following that from outside, from the web, from cameras and so on. So there's a much bigger crowd, because as one would expect, climate change does attract a lot of attention. Um, we have a great uh, lineup of people in this, in this session that is uh, called Acid Rain to Acid Rain, the business case for investing in climate change technology. And I will start from uh, the far right. Uh, far right, we're having Gisli Hoxson uh, from Iceland, right? Yep. Uh, I will not go into any details about their CVs because you have all that information and we'll, we'll try to save some time. Then on the far left, we have Richard Mattison. Uh, on my immediate left, we have uh, Sabrina McCormick, and on my right, we have Alisa Swindler. Swindler sorry. And I'm Spiros Kuvelis. I will be moderating this session, and I will tell you a couple of things and share with my co-speakers a couple of thoughts to start off. Um, what we try to do as a team here of, of speakers is to bring to your attention some thoughts about how we can match investment to climate change, um, offset to addressing the climate change issue, and we'll speak also about a couple of case studies. But before that, I think that uh, one of the uh, opening remarks I would like to make myself is that following a session that I attended yesterday about uh, sustainable financing, I realized that there is quite a lot of, of a gap between financing in the investment world and the actual policy making and those that are called to do things on the ground. So it is very important that we address this gap that we find ways to work all together in order to, to find the solutions for that. Uh, we have much more work between policy makers and the um, civil society, for example, but much less between business sector and investment sector and the policy makers, for example. And that's one of the things that I will uh, be asking our speakers to help us bridge that valley of death, as we call it sometimes, so that good initiatives don't match the, um, the financial incentives that they need to do. Second thing is that uh, we have to keep things in a geographical perspective. Uh, what happened after 2015 is that uh, the current administration in the United States actually left some gap in the world because of the stepping out of the Paris Agreement, which I think and most people tend to think is very keenly taken up by China. Uh, that means that the center of gravity of work on climate change, investment, and technologies is actually shifting eastwards, and that's one of the things that I would like our speakers also to consider in their, their uh, replies and the things that they will be saying. And the third issue, which is very central to what we'll be discussing, is new technologies and climate change, and not only climate change, but the overall construct of the sustainable development goals, because things are interlinking um, among themselves. So climate change needs to be also uh, connected to energy, to transportation and mobility, to food production, uh, to social equity, to gender equity, and so on. Um, some of the technologies that I have personally underlined and think are very important is uh, just as examples, artificial intelligence and the use of big data. Um, I would very strongly welcome you to check one website that is called www.planet.com that shows how we can use all the satellite imagery uh, that exists from all the different satellites that gives you so much knowledge about how the world is evolving and has evolved also to track climate change. Uh, there are new technologies also for decision making and transactions like blockchain technologies that we need to assess and take into account for the future. Of course, there are new technologies for energy production and energy storage. Things are changing very much. Just a few weeks ago in uh, close to Adelaide in South Australia, the biggest battery in the world has been commissioned and put to work. Um, and of course, there are new materials that will be useful for that. So. Uh, I think these are all issues that we need to take into account when we're discussing about climate change and how we bridge the gap with, uh, with investment and how we bring new technologies to provide us with solutions to curbing climate change. But in doing this, I would like first to speak, uh, to, to uh, invite uh, Gisli from uh, Iceland to tell us a bit about the technologies that he's working on and how you see this, this uh, connecting to the addressing the climate change question. Gisli. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, so I'm, I'm from Iceland originally, but uh, um, uh, I founded a company called Gamma 10 years ago. So I'm its chairman and uh, CEO. And uh, being from Iceland, uh, we are of course very, very well aware of, of renewable energy and uh, probably at the forefront there with 100% uh, renewable um, uh, energy utilization. And um, 
geothermal is about one third of that. Uh, in our investments, uh, we, we are managing about one and a half uh, billion dollars. Uh, about a hundred million dollars of those are invested in, in geothermal. Uh, we are running a, a fund which is actually US, based in the US, investing into uh, Latin America uh, in cooperation with KFW. What we're doing there is basically um, a grant funding for early uh, uh, research in geothermal areas. Uh, the reason being is, is that uh, there is a lot of know-how that has been built up in Iceland over the last few decades in, in geothermal. Um, and actually, geothermal energy has been utilized in Iceland ever since the first settlers came there from, from Norway in around the year 900. But it wasn't until uh, 110 years ago we started to utilize the geothermal uh, uh, wastewater, basically, uh, for house heating. And today, about 80% of all houses are heated by hot water, what we call district heating. About 50 years ago, uh, the first geothermal power plant was built in Iceland. 11 years ago, in, in, in geothermal, that is. And uh, 10 or 11 years ago, the largest one to date was built, which is around 300 megawatts. And now we have about 750 megawatts of, of geothermal power, and which is about one third of all energy consumption in Iceland. And I Iceland actually consumes quite a lot of energy. Uh, it's actually the second largest energy producer in the world per capita. The, the reason being is that there's a lot of heavy industry in Iceland, mainly in, in aluminum. So most of the largest aluminum manufacturers have aluminum plants. And we are actually exporting this energy indirectly uh, through the production of aluminum, the most uh, energy intensive industry you can find. And actually this year, I think about 6% of all aluminum in the world will be produced in Iceland. And actually more aluminum being produced there than in the US, for example. But the, uh, the knowledge of, of, of the geothermal uh, industry in Iceland is quite significant. And uh, it wasn't until a few years ago that uh, Iceland started to basically take that knowledge and, and use that for investments abroad in the geothermal uh, industry and that industry has been very much up and coming uh, on a global scale uh, energy produced by geothermal is less than one percent of our total energy consumption it's about 13 gigawatts uh, in 24 countries but uh, today uh, it's uh, there are about 13 to 14 gigawatts which are either under um, uh, construction or uh, are planning to be built in the next few years and uh, estimates uh, tell, tell us that in, in, in about uh, 13 years, we're going to see, in uh, 2013, 30, we're going to see about 34 uh, gigawatts of, of, of uh, geothermal energy being produced. And the same research, they tell us that about 200 gigawatts uh, globally would be, uh, are, uh, we, could, we could utilize uh, economically, uh, given today's technology. To put that into perspective, uh, 200 gigawatts is, is about 20% uh, of the capacity of uh, hydropower, for example, and it's about two-thirds of the current uh, capacity of, of solar today. So it's a sizable, sizable amount. Um, the, uh, the countries that can utilize uh, geothermal power are uh, more than you might think. You're usually connected to volcanic areas, countries who are on the, uh, either the Pacific Rim or, or on the tectonic plates. But advances in deep drilling technology, which we've been working on in Iceland for the last few years, have meant that we've been able to uh, explore areas uh, of, of which don't have volcanic activity and utilize it both for energy uh, or electricity production, but also for uh, district heating or house heating. And we're seeing now uh, boreholes being, being uh, drilled, for example, in, in Germany and in, in, in China. And actually, the biggest initiative in uh, house uh, heating by hot water is in China. We have um, a Sinopec Green Energy uh, in cooperation with uh, an Icelandic company called Orca Energy uh, uh, investing in that area. And today, they have about 3 million households which are heated by hot water. 
And that means that you don't have to use gas or coal. So it's extremely environmentally friendly. And they are working on uh, a tenfold increase over the next few years, going up to around 30 million households, which is going to be sim is probably similar to the amount of households in Germany, for example. So it's, it's, a, it's a massive, massive initiative. And by this deep drilling technology, we're seeing, seeing other places as well, which are becoming much, much more viable. And uh, that is something that uh, we have been investing in and are continuing to do in the next few years. Kisli, can I ask you one question about geothermal energy? I know from our part of the world, which is the Mediterranean, that it's also used in lower temperatures for, for example, for uh, food production in, in greenhouses and so on. Yeah. But overall, as one form of renewable energy that is not as much used as it could be, uh, what would be your assessment of the cost to, to uh, benefit? Is it a, a cost-efficient technology to use? Yeah, definitely on, on, on uh, today, uh, on um, areas, uh, you know, the volcanic areas, it is absolutely uh, economically viable, mm -hmm. definitely. Uh, but with those advances in, uh, in the deep drilling technology, we're getting ever closer to it being uh, economically viable without any uh, subsidies. Right, which means that you start to see also investor in investor interest in the promotion of this technology globally. Yeah, yeah fi you said, we're, fi we're finally starting to see that the the main the main hindrance has basically been the fact that the exploration side is a capital intensive and also risky. Okay. But once you go to the later stage of the exploration side, it becomes actually it, the de-risking is is pretty massive, and uh, the main reason is the fact that. Um, energy output from uh, geothermal is constant base load. So mm -hmm. it's 24-7, 365. So that means that you can make longer offtake contracts, for example. So it's easier to fund a production facility of geothermal than, for example, in, in, in solar in, in that sense. But the problem has been in the, uh, in the uh, basically in the beginning, uh, the research phase. Right. And there, there we've mostly seen development agencies and IFIs coming into that uh, mm -hmm. instead of uh, private investors. But we're seeing more and more private, uh, private equity investors and public, uh, uh, public investors coming into, into that market. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, I would now propose that we shift to another set of, of examples and case studies. <coughs> Alyssa Swidler, to my right, has done a tremendous quantity of work both on ocean issues, and we all know that oceans are one of the biggest carbon sinks in the world, uh, but also has done some great work in Africa, and I will not say very much about it because you will say very much about it. <laughs> okay, hi. Uh, I actually originally started all my philanthropic work focusing on access to medicine. So the work um, across sort of West and Central Africa uh, fell into my lap. We were looking at um, access to medicine around Lake Chad, and I actually had no idea at the time of uh, the result of climate change on this massive lake that had been the size of New Jersey and now has shrunk by 95%. So I will refer to my notes just so that I don't mess anything up. But it, it, the area of Lake Chad is in the Sahel between the Savannah and the Sahara. And it's basically about 100 million people living there. Uh, then the lake has shrunk, the rivers dried up, there's less fish, the fish are actually smaller, there's drought, there's famine. There's also, unfortunately, Boko Haram in the mix of everything. So it's really this kind of massive humanitarian disaster that no one in the developed world actually is even aware of. So I thought today I would share that with all of you uh, because for me it's a big focus and it kind of ticks both the environmental boxes as well as the humanitarian boxes. Um, and even organizations that you might think of, you know, UNICEF in terms of um, donating vaccines, they don't donate the ability to uh, transport those vaccines. So that's been a big focus for, for my own uh, philanthropic efforts, I would say. Um, the, the other side of it is I've worked with Virgin Unite and Richard Branson for a long time, also on humanitarian efforts. And we decided about uh, two years ago to, Virgin Unite is the arm, the philanthropic arm of the Virgin Group. And we decided to form an organization called Ocean Unite, which uh, the idea was to use the relationships um, the branding relationships to highlight uh, the plight of the oceans and to actually form an ocean SDG uh, 
to, to stipulate uh, basically that, that climate change happens above and below the water, that uh, poverty, poverty eradication can't be ended without um, safeguarding the oceans. And by, I would say, partnering with recognizable brands like Google Earth, um, and of course, leveraging the Virgin relationship, we've gotten a lot of press around that. Um, we've also partnered with Oceana and Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio and um, Global Fishing Watch, which obviously tracks over fishing. So my biggest thing, I think, when it comes to, to climate change is that it's, if you talk to, I would call it humanitarian philanthropists, they might, it's very easy to say, well, you know, I don't, I don't fund environmental causes. Um, and I, I get that a lot. And I try to actually make the humanitarian case for why you want to sort of broaden your reach. Um, I think that, that the having an SDG, which a lot of people can, can relate to from a, the United Nations level, um, just so everyone's aware of that, this, it stipulates that we're reducing ocean pollution, we're reducing o ocean acidification from CO2, we're combating climate change by curbing carbon emissions, and we're actually using the Pacific Islands as, as countries um, that are, are facing a loss of 50 to 80 percent um, of their fish due directly to climate change. So it's, it's trying to, I would say, humanize um, funding climate change initiatives. That's, that's my perspective on it. Thank you so much. Um, can I ask you just to, to give us a little bit, uh, if you have readily in your mind now, uh, a couple of cases from Africa, for example, where climate change is really impacting now people's lives, how, how it really happens. I mean, if, if we just transposition ourselves in Africa and we're living there, how would climate change impact us? I really, I, I, I don't want to be repetitive, but I, I do have to kind of go back to Lake Chad because this was this massive lake that, that borders four countries where it was the basis. There was never hunger. There were never any of these humanitarian crises. And in the last, tw not even that long, 20, 25 years, to have that huge body of water shrink by 95% as a direct uh, kind of relation to climate change and the rivers the rivers that were feeding the lake dried up. So you can kind of trace it back to that. Um, I, I personally, then, then there's famine, then there's drought, mm -hmm. um, there's disease. There's, I mean, it, it, is, it really was a safe haven, and it's really imploded in the last 25 years. Right. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, now I think we'll turn to the left side to me, right side to you. And I will first turn to Sabrina McCormick that has a done very much work as a scientist on, on uh, climate change. Um, before we go towards the investment side and the ESG investment, ESG meaning environmental, sustainable, and governance um, uh, arranged investment, I want to ask you one question as a scientist on environmental change. Is it true that scientists on, on, on climate change have decided that uh, Donald Trump does not exist? <laughs> 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 Unfortunately, no. We don't have that choice. <laughs> but the other, the, the, the opposite has been actually said. Yes, he it has that been said. Climate change yeah. does not exist. So, uh, would you like to tell us a couple of things about how you, uh, through the different panels that you work on, you see the link between ESG investment and climate change? Yeah, and you know, before I, I'm going to, as a filmmaker, I feel compelled to tell a. I'll keep it short, story. But before I tell a story, which might communicate to you in some way that I don't believe that we should be transitioning rapidly to renewable energy, let me just say that um, you know, uh, uh, last year or the year before, IPCC released its most recent assessment, which said that we have, if you do the calculation, three years to peak carbon emissions globally to avoid catastrophic climate change, to avoid two degrees C. So, these investments that we're thinking about making in climate change technologies broadly defined are essentially the key to protecting the future of the human race. Let me just say that first. Um, and then let me tell you a, a, about a case I've been working on for, oh my God, over a decade, which um, I'm actually in less than 24 hours going to, to shoot a film about, which is the Belo Monte Dam, which is in the Eastern Amazon the Brazilian Amazon, which was first proposed um, in the early 1980s as Brazil transitioned from a military dictatorship to a democracy. 
and they decided that they needed to advance economic development, and in so doing, and they were at the time reliant very much so on hydro, on large hydro, and still are, um, they decided that they would start building large dams again and decided they would build this dam. Now, um, this case uh, illustrates many lessons, um, which I'll, I'll kind of summarize at the end, but even in the early days of this proposition, you see how ESG principles are so important. So what happened? Local indigenous populations who would be illegally affected by the construction of this dam now in Brazil, they are legally charged with the approval of large scale development that will affect their, their lands. They came forward and began protesting. These protests were actually supported by, first by Sting, then in later years by James Cameron, the famed director of Avatar, Titanic, et cetera, Sigourney Weaver, Arnold Schwarzenegger, all went down to this dam personally to support these indigenous populations. Why so important? You would think hydro is a good thing, right? We think of hydro as a sustainable renewable energy. Well, in the case of the Amazon and other kinds of rainforest areas, actually dams, when they flood a large area, they end up releasing methane, which is a much more potent greenhouse gas, about 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And we need to stop um, immediately methane emissions. But methane is not actually even calculated as an environmental impact in, in many projects. It's, and in this hydro project, for example, it was also not calculated. Well, Many years, 30 years of protest in this particular project, $11 billion project, which initially was invested in by many, many international companies around the world. Initially, Siemens was a 35% owner of this dam or investor in this dam. To the point of today where the dam is entirely invested in by Brazilian domestic sources and public uh, resources in that country. The actual shape of that dam was changed by these many years of protest. Initially, it was um, kind of a, a normal design where there was a large, and the, the Amazon is quite flat, right? So you have a very large reservoir area that has to be created in order to create the pressure to um, have the, the necessary pressure to generate energy. Well, all of this protest led to um, the dam being redesigned as what's called a run-through dam. So it's actually a much narrower, much smaller area of flooding. And so, you know, the actual investment itself, it really did affect many investors around the world who invest in large-scale infrastructure, as well as those in Brazil. The last two presidents were actually brought up on corruption charges around their involvement in getting this dam approved. Um, uh, President Lula is actually going to jail in part over his involvement in this corruption. So we see now this dam still, the, the final licensing approval for this dam being in and out of court, in and out of court, whether or not the dam, which is now built, can actually function. There's no energy being generated from this massive project, which has already displaced people and affected these legally protected indigenous people. So what do we learn from this? One, social risks are real when we think about large scale infrastructure, when we think about many business operations. I mean, many aspects of the, of the business operating chain is, are affected by these kinds of social risks, which I mean, I can talk about in many different dimensions. This is just one example. Secondly, the climate risk is real too. So the projections of energy development or pro um, energy uh, generation from this dam are, people are saying now are about 70% less than what they will actually be because the water, the rainfall has decreased so much in the Amazon. 2005, worst drought in history. 2010, worst drought in history in the Amazon. We're seeing the microclimate in the Amazon change pretty radically. And this will affect how much money is made actually from the generation of energy from this dam if it ever gets licensed, which I, I believe it will, but it w is taking much, much longer than it, and it, than it ever should have, and, and here's, there is also, of course, the question, should it ever have been built? So this is just one example of how um, we need to be thinking about ESG concerns in all scales, in all uh, aspects of business functioning. And also, I think, um, you know, thinking about ESG concerns allows companies the opportunity to be a leader in addressing the concerns of civil society and in pulling in the best and the brightest who are now beginning to demand that companies that they want to work for be sustainable, be green, be, have, a, have a very low carbon footprint. 
Um, so thinking about some of these issues, I think, is very important for the community in this room and, and online watching now, too. Thank you very much. I think that uh, that's one of the points that I, I picked in yesterday's discussion about sustainable financing and investment, that unless you do properly your, your homework on ESG issues before you engage into an investment, besides running the risk of doing something that is not sustainable for the planet or for the, the population where the project is taking place, you might actually be entering a very difficult uh, long-term series of problems for your own investment. And this is a very, very, very characteristic case where investment has been now bogged to a project that is taking very, very long to go on. So uh, I would like to turn to Richard. Uh, Richard, you're going to have to tell a story better than a filmmaker, which is very difficult. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> but um, <coughs> you have been uh, working very much also with important institutions like the European Union and the Commission on the assessing the investments on the ESG side, on uh, assessing the risk in both uh, environmental and financial uh, ways. So please explain to us how this is done and how this could be explained also to policymakers so they know how to take this into account. Yeah, thank you, Spira. So um, Trucos is a division, uh, a part of S&P. Um, I sold Trucos to S&P last October. Um, and what we do is we provide data on risk and opportunity, specifically on environmental issues, um, and specifically analyzing externalities, so positive and negative externalities. And um, what we've done is uh, we've created data sets that have informed divestment campaigns by sovereign wealth funds, data sets that have informed um, reallocation of capital. We find, uh, for example, the world's largest asset owner right now is thinking about how to allocate 10% of its assets uh, to ESG. So this is GPIF. And we found that Swiss Re has shifted all of their benchmarks um, from traditional market-based benchmarks to ESG-based benchmarks across the 120 billion uh, worth of assets under management they have. So we're seeing some, some fairly major shifts by leading asset owners and, and asset managers as well. Um, but what's sometimes missing at the core of this is data and analysis and insight on exactly how to shift that capital. And so we've been, uh, for example, at S&P, S&P Ratings has developed a green evaluation tool that allows you to analyze the greenness or not of a particular asset or project or, or indeed company. So in the example of a dam, then this tool could be applied to assess not just the greenhouse gas mitigation aspect, but also the other environmental aspects associated with biodiversity loss and, and various other types of issues. So we believe that is actually critical information that should feed into markets. But you still have a bit of a challenge uh, in order to finance SDGs, we may need as much as two trillion or more um, in terms of capital. That's not going to come from philanthropy. That has to come from a reallocation of capital from capital markets. And so how do we drive that reallocation? Well, for the past year, I've been working uh, with regulators, financial regulators in Europe as part of a high-level expert group on sustainable finance. This is a group that was put together by Vice President Dombrovskis in January. And our remit is to provide discrete policy recommendations, financial policy interventions to regulators by the end of this year that will drive a lot of capital that is sitting on fairly low yields to sustainable purposes. Um, so it's really a large-scale reallocation of capital that's required. And what regulators are interested in is how can they change aspects of regulation to drive that. So I'd like to highlight, just in the interest of time, just a couple of things um, in terms of policy recommendations that are already being um, consulted on right now. And, and um, it'd be great if, if everybody could be um, part of this consultation. Um, the first is what uh, the European uh, regulators have looked at is actually do we have a sufficient definition of the duty of an investor? So we have you know, the principle of a prudent person. Um, we actually have fairly loose definitions of the duty of investors in Europe. Um, and so what the European Union is consulting on, the European Commission is consulting on right now, is actually incorporating environmental, social, and governance factors as a core part of the fiduciary duty of investors. And and other actors in the financial chain. So this is not just asset owners, this is asset managers and banks across the investment chain. So if you do that, then you actually encourage really, or force uh, all of the actors in the financial chain, not just to consider financial outcomes, but to also consider environmental, social, and governance outcomes. 
Now, now why, have, why do they think this is a good idea? Well, they think this is a good idea because these outcomes are all linked. They will drive a growth story for the European Union, for the world. They will drive more sustainable economies. Lord Stern uh, in the UK in 2006 published the Stern Review, and the Stern Review said that um, the, the consequences of not addressing climate change could be as, could be as much as 20% of GDP lost per annum, and the cost of addressing climate change is between 1% and 5%. Recently at COP23 in Bonn, he said he thinks that the downside risk was underestimated vastly in his original study. So in other words, if we don't address ESG, we face a massive problem with growth. We face a negative growth story, which is, which is a, a difficulty in general in terms of how we think about assets. Uh, and then the second aspect of the recommendations that we're working on with the European Commission and DG FISMA in particular is, can we develop a very clear system for classifying what is green, what is not green? What is sustainable, what is not sustainable? What would be in alignment with the sustainable development goals if you're an investor, and what wouldn't be in alignment? And if you can come up with a taxonomy that describes different types of assets, projects, and even uh, revenues that companies generate that are either green or not green, then you have a baseline from which you can set different standards. You can, as uh, an asset manager, for example, examine different ways of a sort of um, pass-fail, if you like. This is a, a kind of new set of screening criteria. Now, the European Investment Bank is working on that with the Climate Bonds Institute, with S&P and various others. Um, and we would welcome uh, input um, and feedback on that as it's being launched. So what will be launched in December by Vice President Dombrovskis at the, the Do's Do's conference in, in, um, in Paris, hosted by uh, Macron, uh, will be a taxonomy um, that will illustrate how you can consider investments in the context of SDGs um, at a high level and in a, in a, in a deep dive, in, um, how you can look at climate mitigation as a specific aspect. Uh, and what will this do? This will essentially mean that if you're an investor, you now have some clarity on the types of things you can invest in. If you're an asset owner looking across your entire portfolio of assets, 1.2 trillion worth of assets that GPIF have, you can actually assess the extent to which your portfolio is aligned with a, a, a more sustainable world. And Really what we need is better transparency in markets to allow that capital to flow. We need incentives to allow that capital to flow. Um, and that's what these policy recommendations will be, will be aimed at. So, so look for the recommendations being announced on the 12th of the 12th, and we would definitely welcome feedback. And that's, that's this December, right? Yes. That's OK. Uh, let me just ask you one, one additional point on what you said, which I find very interesting. First of all, it's great that we, we will have this kind of taxonomy that people can understand what is green, what is greenwashed, and what is sustainable, which is very useful. Um, but I think you said you used two terms that I found very interesting. You, you made the difference between encouraging and uh, imposing. And I think that in some cases, when you talk about investment, you have to take into account the time perspective, because in some cases, investors want to make a, a real return, quick return. And if you take the time out of the equation, everything is sustainable. Uh, but if you put a time perspective, for example, what the climate change effect will be in the microclimate by doing this dam, then 20 years down the road, it's really not sustainable. So. Is this a parameter that will be taken into account? Because some investors will say, okay, sustainable or not, I prefer to make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, time horizons is, is, is actually an issue. So I think that um, from, from the feedback that we've got from the market so far, you find that asset owners tend to have very long time horizons. Um, you know, they, 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 they might have a 30 year time horizon. Um, but the way in which assets are actually managed is over a very short time horizon. And so you have a mismatch, really, between um, the, how the, the value of assets over time and how they can be affected and, and how assets are actually managed. So, so one of the sets of recommendations will be around how can we provide better information to markets on both aspects. Because markets have a lot of information about short time horizons mm -hmm. and practically zero information about long time horizons. And so if we have both aspects, then you can choose. You may choose to make a short-term return, but at least you know what the long-term consequences of making that short-term return are. And if you're an asset owner and it's part of your duty to consider ESG, mm -hmm. then if you have both aspects of information flowing towards you, you might actually 
make some different decisions. You might award some different types of mandates, and that could actually change behavior. Yeah. And really, it's behavior change that will drive a change in the real economy. That's great. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, now, we have about 15 minutes uh, until this session is finished. I just want to go for one rebound question that I have thought <coughs> while I heard those speakers, and then we will open it to questions from you. Uh, but I wanted uh, to, to start with uh, Gisli. Uh, you spoke about one specific uh, sector, let's say, of, of energy production. Um, I would like you to, to tell us if this development of geothermal energy is also one case where new technologies, new innovation is, is being brought up besides, you know, deepening the work that you're doing through deep boreholes and deep drilling and all that. So does it actually create new technologies, new jobs, new entrepreneurship opportunities, this development of energies? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, this is actually cutting edge technology that we're seeing. And, uh, and uh, it is, uh, you know, a little bit like something from a sci-fi movie, a bit, when you're drilling down to five kilometers. Uh, actually, the status of the water down there is not the status that we know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and actually, uh, it is estimated that in a few years we will be able to drill down to about eight kilometers as well. So that's going to open up basically the entire planet for, for geothermal. So it's going to be extremely uh, interesting uh, uh, over the next few years to see how we utilize that technology. It, it is. It is uh, on, a, on an experimental scale still, but there was this project, it's called the Icelandic Deep Drilling Project, and uh, they reached uh, depths of four kilometers and, and 700 meters this, uh, this summer. And uh, the, the plan is to go even deeper in, in the next couple of years. And that is something that's easy to implement then for other, other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be extremely important, as I said, in the district heating or house heating. So we might see a, a t total revelation in that over the last few years. Some have compared the, uh, this deep drilling um, uh, revelation basically uh, to fracking, the impact that fracking had on, on fossil fuels basically. And what do you think about that? I mean, if you compare the deep drilling to fracking, because fracking was, has, has been very badly criticized. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. But I'm talking about the disruption that it makes in, yeah. the, in the industry, for example. So, so for example, if, if, if it is a viable option to heat your houses with hot water instead of coal uh, and gas, just think about the environmental impact of, of that mm -hmm. in, in large cities. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to turn to Alisa again. Um, you spoke about the work that you've been doing in the islands. And <coughs> I remember uh, about a year ago, I was in a conference with the Vice Prime Minister of Samoa. It was a time that the funding for small islands has been uh, significantly cut because of the changes in financing, because of the uh, removal of the United States from, from the fund. And one thing that marked me is that she said that it's not always a case that we try to raise more capital or more funds for doing that. It's sometimes a case that we need to do more with what we have. Um, now, my question specifically because of your experience working with the oceans and small islands, um, Richard mentioned that in order to address the SDGs, we'll need to mobilize a few trillions of dollars. But I tend to think that sometimes we just need to do incremental steps that can make a very big difference. What would you think about that, specifically with the small islands? Because they have the clock ticking. I mean, climate change and sea, sea level rise will actually just obliterate them. Um, how can you deal with that? Do you need to, to, to mobilize a lot of capital, or you need to go cleverly about using new technologies and limited quantities of capital. I totally agree with you in that. Uh, sorry, Richard, but just that it has to be. Oh, sure. It has to be. <laughs> no, no, because I've thought about it. And I think that especially given in, in today's climate, it has to be an incremental shift you know, in order to get anything done. And it also has to be um, incremental political will. So that, for me, that's everything I do is, is, has a political undertone. And that's probably the, the, what I would say is the first step. So getting, out, getting all the politicians on board and the decision makers on board and not scaring them away by saying trillions of dollars, because that frightens people. Um, that, that's one of them. And actually, ironically, they, I found that uh, politicians respond very well to business. So if it's a big brand that everyone says it's you know multinational recognizable brand that gets behind it and says we're we're behind this effort, 
um, or we're behind trying to solve this problem, um, it's a little bit of an instant call to action uh, for political will and then uh, incremental dollars. But I do agree with, with Richard in terms of it not being um, philanthropically driven, that it has to be, it has to be more than that. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a very good point, and I, I want to thank all of you that brought it up. Now, uh, I'm, I'm actually, yeah, I think I will turn to you, Sabrina. Um, you mentioned one case of a big infrastructure project, uh, which has a lot of detrimental effects. It could have raised a lot of capital and so on. Staying on the same issue, uh, we will need to mobilize a few trillions to make sure that the SDGs are being put into implementation, all that. But again, do we have, you think, the tools to gauge up front the effect of mobilizing such big quantities of capitals to make changes? Or do we first need to put in place the tools that Richard was describing and then say that we move from the incremental to the big scale to make things happen? I, I mean, I think everything has to happen at once because we don't have time to be developing tools and then implementing them. The tools, I think, have to be developed. I mean, the capital is being invested. Projects are moving forward everywhere, globally, right? And so we have to be integrating these tools, integrating this new way of thinking about investment into these projects, into um, asset management. I mean, we have to, we are moving. I mean, the fact is that the renewable energy sector is growing more jobs in the United States for the past two quarters than any other sector. It's moving. And it doesn't matter what the Trump administration does. I mean, it matters. I don't, don't, <laughs> don't, don't walk away with the thought that I don't think that the federal government has an influence. It does. But the private sector, I mean, I worked at the Environmental Protection Agency for two years even under Obama, and this was prior to him really taking climate change as his frontline issue. Um, and I walked away from EPA feeling like the private sector was going to be more important than the federal government. Now the federal government has to, and governments around the world need to be creating rules by which the private sector can act in a secure way, but the federal government is always behind everybody else. So uh, I, you know, I, I think that, and to, to answer your question, Everything has to be moving forward at once. We have right. no time to wait. Well, I, I was expecting something like this because uh, I think that, uh, I mean, both, both positions are correct. The incremental steps where you cannot really take all of the, of the bite in one chunk is important uh, because you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. But I think that we don't have the time to just linger and, and wait until everything is being ready that we move along. Uh, but now I'd like to turn again to Richard because you explained us very well how you're setting the background for all this. Um, in the last few months, I've been involved in setting up a coalition between the University of Cambridge and the European Public Law Organization to make sure that all the actors involved in implementing SDGs, governments, businesses, uh, civil society, investors, they get together and they, they see which are the things that they're doing right and which are the things that are doing wrong with each other. Um, my question to you is, say you have reached that point in December and you have the taxification and you have all the rules and everything, do you think that governments have the legislative tools in place to be ready to implement that? And do you think that companies have the knowledge and, and know-how and capacity to actually take this information in and do something with it? I, I think we will make mistakes. That's um, okay. But we have to fail forward because I, I, I agree we don't really have time. So I, I think that um, there's certainly political appetite in, in the European level um, to, to create change very quickly. The intention is whichever of these recommendations the European Commission believes needs to be implemented will be implemented next year. There, the, 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 um, the, the point I made about investor duties, there is a live consultation right now as a consequence of our discussions in, in July. So that will be implemented next year for sure. Um, so the nature and uh, definition of uh, investor duties will change next year in all likelihood. So I think there's certainly political will. Um, I, think, I think that, um, I, d I do agree by the way, that, that there should be incremental change as well. It's just that the framing of the problem is, is that we, we really do need to allocate capital um, quite quickly um, in targeted and precise ways. Uh, and so I think, I think things, decisions are being made now. I think decisions are being made by asset owners as well very quickly. So it's not just policy makers that are making decisions here. It's actually the huge mobilization of capital that we're <coughs> observing. Um, if you just look at green bonds, um, green bonds are accelerating in pace. 
But the bond market as a whole, it won't be long before the entire bond market will be assessed for its greenness. Yeah. So there will be questions about bonds that are issued that are not green, as much as there is a spotlight on bonds that are issued that are green. And so I actually think we're, we're going to see a wholesale um, set of uh, transparent indicators mm -hmm. that will span different asset classes that will become available to asset owners that will then be able to rethink how they allocate capital. And so that's exciting right. because when we talk about scale, that, that is something that, that a few individuals in, in, in large asset owners can make some big changes. When um, uh, Norge's bank, NBIM, uh, recommended to the Norwegian government that the Sovereign Wealth Fund divested of oil and gas two weeks ago, it crashed the energy markets. Mm -hmm in those places where the energy markets were dependent on fossil fuels. So I think there can be some quite big changes made very quickly um, should we have the um, both investor and business desire, private sector desire, and political desire. Thank you very much. Uh, with this, I would like now to open the floor to your questions, if you have any. I <coughs> see you have maybe more than we have time for. Um, Peter, would you like to go first? Sure, Peter from Environmental Finance. <clears throat> Just interested in the taxonomy which will be announced on the 12th of December. Perhaps you can give us a bit more detail on that. For example, will it be uh, a final product or will it still be a work in progress that needs consultation? How much granularity will it give on specific types of energy, for example, like nuclear or indeed large-scale hydro? Yeah, it will be pretty deep. It will be a usable taxonomy for climate mitigation, um, but that will, that will need to be consulted on. Um, but it will also be broad, and, and in other aspects, um, the framework will not be complete. So the idea is to showcase what a framework would look like across all of the SDGs, which is a pretty tough challenge to come up with a very detailed framework that is instantly applicable um, for all of the SDGs. And I think there needs to be a lot more work and consultation on that. However, in climate mitigation, perhaps climate adaptation as well, um, it will be fairly detailed. And as I said, the European Investment Bank and others are, are working on that um, right now. Thank you, Richard. And uh, Abid? Abid. Abid, yes. Thanks, yeah. Abid Kamali with Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. A question actually for um, Gisli. J can you unpick a little bit more about the de-risking you said that was um, necessary in the geothermal sector up front because of the higher capex? Has the, the capex come down? Is there sufficient public finance flowing or philanthropic capital flowing? Is there a need for a geothermal insurance product? J just if you think about the scale up that's required, yeah. how do we get there? Yeah, I think uh, we are in the early stages, absolutely, in that if, if we look at the, uh, the growth of uh, geothermal over the last few years, it has been massive. Um, uh, today, in, in the, uh, the green field, basically, in the, uh, in the uh, exploration part, it is mostly government initiative, it is development agencies, international financial institutions uh, that are providing, I would say, grants instead of investments in that field. Um, but, uh, but there are more private equity type investors coming in at a later stage. So I think we might need to start to mix those two more together. Uh, but uh, the technology is actually pushing it forward because there's also much better technology in, in finding the right wells and in, in increasing the likelihood of finding a, a resource that is uh, economically viable. Basically, so uh, we're moving in the, in the right direction, but still in the early stages, we're just seeing government initiatives there, and then the private investors coming in at a later stage. Which I think, uh, in a way, covers what I was saying about this value of death. You know, with new technologies, unless you have this kind of support, you might as well find less funky, let's say, technologies that will fall in that gap and never get, come out of it. Uh, by the way, for every question that is addressed to anyone, please feel free to step in all yeah, of the... Yeah, uh, uh, maybe just uh, one, one more thing on that. I, and I think what might happen uh, is, is uh, we might see investors that uh, will start to build up a large portfolio of assets in that asset class. And that means that they are, you know, because of the risk diversification of their uh, portfolio, they can take on more of the development risk. So we don't have those investors in place yet, but uh, I know that there is there are quite a, quite a few investors thinking about starting to invest in that in that area around the world. Thank you. Let's move quickly to Hannah. To Alyssa and Sabrina, you spend quite a bit of your time thinking about how to communicate on climate. So my question is, what are lessons learned on how to inspire action? <laughs> 
Sure. I mean, I, I, I do. I actually spend most of my time thinking about that question. We actually have a large study that is uh, set in the United States about how people think about climate change, how they respond to information about it, and what motivates them to actually make behavior change. Um, we haven't released these results yet, so you're getting a preview, but some of the key things are um, health. So people don't care about something over there that affects somebody else in another country, although they do actually, interestingly, and conservatives in the United States actually care that, say, China or India is taking a bigger leadership role in renewables in the United States. They don't like that. There's like, somehow the competitive spirit, I think, gets kicked up. Mm -hmm. So that's very interesting. Um, they also don't like uh, when, say, a utility in the United States removes their ability to make choices about if they want renewables or if they want fossil fuels. Because in some states in the United States, you can make a choice, and in some states, you cannot. So they like to have the choice, which makes sense to me from a conservative perspective. Um, but back to the health issue, um, people care most about whether or not their health and the health of their children in particular are going to be affected, which makes sense, right? We all care about that. And so if you bring messages of that, that compels them the most to make change in their own lives. Um, and, you know, they, they really care about real-time risks that most often what we see, and I think all of us in this room probably do this to some degree, climate change is going to affect someone else, somewhere else, not me, but that's just not true. All of us in this room may have already been to some degree affected by climate change and will be. Every population I care about as a climate change expert will be affected by climate change. And so to make that real, I think is the, the most important thing while also showing solutions. Because what you can't do is just scare people like, I don't, you know, I probably, I, I tend to, you know, uh, scare people a little bit, my students especially. Ah! Um, but you also have to give people something to do, because if you scare them without giving them an alternative, a way to act, a way to address this problem that you've given them, then it's actually worse, I think, than saying nothing at all. And Alisa, would you like to also add something to that? Oh, I would say that there are actually very well-known big funders that still refer to climate change like that. So they'll, see, I mean, in, in just in public conversation or, or semi-public conversation. So there, that's a reality, and those are again well-known names, big funders and big American donors. So that for me is a big hump. That until there's no deniability, I'm I'm always facing that, and I think that making it uh, just to echo what Sabrina was saying, just making it as real as possible, that it's not this kind of vague thing that's out there, and educating. I would say. Most of you know I have five children, so sort of educating them from a very early age that this is a real threat and there are things that you can do um, and, and suggesting solutions. And I think on that, because also the clock says zero, so we have to close down here, but I want to stay for just one second to what Alyssa said. I think that education and information at every level, decision makers, companies, the business sector, investors, and everybody is very important. And this is very importantly what the Milken Institute does, a number of other organizations. So let's all try to keep the discussion open for these things and get everyone around us involved as much as we can. Now, I would like a very strong round of applause, show that even a small room can create a lot of applause. <laughs> for you, Kira.